do you think some people are born smart? Like, let's talk about intelligence levels. Do you think some people are just? Levels. Do you think some people are just smart? If you could answer this question, then I mean, it would make sense. Which question? Who gets the awards at school? Are those people changing? How frequently? That should tell you something. I think a lot of people work hard, but only a few people reap the rewards who of that hard work. <laughs> gets <the awards. laughs> he is like, who, who gets who, the certificates? Who gets the awards? Who gets the who? Who gets like, the accolades? Are, are those people changing? Right, if it's the same person every time, I think your point is if it's the same person over th- every time, that should tell you something. That person is just gifted, but that's the thing. I yeah, like. I think I think some people are gifted, and I mean I've seen it myself. Um, I think people have different levels of processing information. Mm. Some process it faster than others. Some even, despite trying so hard to capture information, it's just you not going. Can't. I just I think there are two types of people, three types of people. Mm. There are those that are in, I'd say, inherently smart because immediately they do something, they get it. Mm. And then there are those that are capable of getting stuff. So even though it doesn't click immediately, if they work hard enough, they can get it. Then there are those that just <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> no matter how and I think those are three levels of, of intelligence, I'd say. Yeah, that's, that's fucking... That's and it's cra- as crazy that's as it sounds, I mean, okay. but it's that's true. Smart, <laughs> it's true. Three kinds of people. One... They get things as easily as possible. The yeah. second one, they if, work they, hard. if they do put in the work, they yeah. can't get it. The third one, <laughs> does it matter if they cross night five <laughs> days in a week? Yeah. They still not going to get it. Bioplus. Bioplus. Those things that help you to push. <clears throat> yeah. Within bursts of time. Yeah, like you're like, okay, cool, I'm tired now. Yeah. But you can take that thing and then you can increase the time you spend working or something like that. We could say the same about energy drinks, but well, that's a yeah, separate that's conversation. But yeah, All those do they things. work? Yes, they, they do. Are they necessary? Why do we have to push ourselves beyond the limit that it's natural, if I may say, or what God has given us? Because now it's like we pushing ourselves. It's, I mean... <laughs> You know this, if, if you're chasing a deadline that is about to close at 12, even though God has given you a, a natural gift to, <laughs> to push, but you realize that, no, this is just not enough for me to get through the whole assignment. Why are you chasing a deadline? You could have done that thing for But that's the thing. We never do it on time. And once why? we are out of time. Why? Why? Uh, you have to ask that question to every student. Because <laughs> I, I challenge you, no, uh, no student ever starts an assignment on the day they're given the assignment. I feel like that's, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> it doesn't. It no depends. student ever there, there are starts some, it. There are some people who literally start it the first day they get it. Right? I guess, I mean, yeah. And I feel like maybe this is a question more of like an answer, right? I feel like sometimes, don't you think if you're doing something that you love doing, Right, mm. something that you love doing. If they give you an assignment, you see it as like, mm, this is a chance for me to do something that I love doing, and then you jump at it. Same time, I think there are nuances to loving to do what you're doing. How, for me, it's like people have a general tendency to love things that they are good at, for example, or things they know they can do. Now, does you? either knowing how to do something or being good at it, does that define love for that subject? Yes. So now I'm asking myself, I'm do you good love at accounting, accounting, but why don't I love it? Also, you don't love accounting? <laughs> no, I love it. I love accounting. I feel like... Oh, yeah. Or maybe maybe the problem is like I love accounting. But you love something that, else more. Nah, nah, nah. I love accounting, but it's just that how it's structured and taught in universities, it makes you to hate that thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay. like they're rushing through the content. Now it's no longer about you engaging with the thing because you love it and trying to learn. It's about you always chasing the deadline, always trying to make the most of the time so that you can pass that exam. It's not about you engaging with the content and saying, what's the why behind this? Why am I doing this? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Now it's just like, okay, cool. I'm studying this thing so that I can pass the next assignment, submit this thing. I, never, and I don't get to engage with it as like on a deeper level. That's what I'm saying. Mm, yeah. If, if 
there was a way to get you to engage with it at a deeper level, what would that be? Expand the time that they provide for you to learn the subject matter or I don't think it's expand what? the time, but I feel like have you ever taken like an online course? Because he said it was rushed. Have you yes, I have it? taken. I have taken a public speaking online course. That's what I'm saying. Like I took it procrastinating, but yeah. Procrastinating. Yeah. It's something I call productive procrastination, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yo, my point is I don't know, man. When you're taking something, uh, maybe like a online course or whatever it is, yeah. it's always easier for you to engage in that thing because you chose for yourself to do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but exactly. now, at university, it's like you don't <coughs> choose to do certain things. They tell you to do, the, do certain things. <laughs> <laughs> but, but don't you feel like it's because there's a specific deadline to the, work, the schoolwork? For example, you have a calendar to it. But with something like an online course, it's something that you've opted to do out of your free time. Free time and free will. Exactly. Unlike university where they have deadlines to meet. We have a semester that ends in June. I think if if you generally struggle with taking instructions, then it becomes <laughs> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes I mean it, it becomes very difficult. No, I feel like that's true. <laughs> I feel like that's true. That's my only Because you feel like you're, you are conforming to someone's preset structure of how something should be done. Yeah. And if you are not the kind of person to be told what to do and how to do it, then that's not going to be something you, yeah, you that's, enjoy. That's, that's a good answer. That. <laughs> that's, that, that's a good answer. <laughs> For example, a question paper, what is it actually testing? Hmm. The quality of your answers or how fast you finish the paper. Because if you have three questions and you spend the whole three hours only writing question one and it's so perfect, it doesn't matter at the end of the day because you would have failed the assessment. Yeah, but you can, yeah. Yeah, but I feel I feel like they're teaching yeah. you different skills. Remember, even if Time you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like okay. if you <laughs> yeah. go to like the r yeah. real world, like corporate yeah. or whatever it is, no one has time, even if you can get to an answer, but if you can get to it, in like a year we don't want that we want people who can get results as fast as possible that's exactly what they're testing yeah, so because they're testing. you can spoke you... about quality the quality of your answer or how fast you can do it i guess they are also trying to get you to have a good balance between quality and the amount of time spent yeah, something. yeah, yeah. i don't know that i mean that largely depends on the people being tested how effectively they use their time to apply themselves across all the questions they are asked i think that depends on people themselves how you also reflect after the exam or, or after mm. the paper you are writing, how you reflect on the time you took for each but, specific question. But, you know, in support of what he said, right, I've heard people in the workplace say that the, the pressure that we go through under an exam is so unnecessary yeah. when you get to the workplace. Why? At the workplace, everyone is there for quality. If you are going to be employed by someone, it's because you're able to produce quality not necessarily how fast you do it, but how best you do it. So don't you think such things should be revised within the change of time? Some things, for example, like he said, if I can answer a question best, but not complete the paper, but I still fail, yet when I get to a workplace, it's about the best and not how fast you did it. I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's true. Quality. I also don't think yeah. that's true, because if you think about it, I don't know. Let's take it back to like entrepreneurship. Sure. The only reason why some people are successful and some are not is because some are obsessed with, I want to get the best product. And some are like, okay, cool. Even if it's not perfect, I'm going to roll it out to the market and then I'm going to start making progress. I'm going to alter it from that. Right? So I feel like that's the only difference. If you're obsessed with quality, you're never going to get something done because you're so obsessed with quality. But if you can get something done as quickly as you can, then you have results, you have progress. One percent progress is better than nothing at all. Yeah. They call it the they call they call it the Is it poor poor it has to repeat. Is it is it's a it's a paralysis of sorts where you want everything to be perfect before you go ahead to something else. And I think I mean that's one of the things they're trying to test. How much of what you put down on paper or how much of what you've attempted to do. Are you comfortable with to move on? I guess the thing, but 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 anyway, I feel like we should start the podcast now. <laughs> we should start the podcast. We've been running for some time, so 
Uh, hey guys, so my name is Blessing Malambo, and most people say I'm an academic coach, <coughs> productivity coach, whatever you uh, decide to call me. Uh, so studying honors in accounting right now, I did my undergrad in accounting. Do I love accounting? That's a question for another day. But for today, let's talk about academic tips. Let's talk about the journey from high school, university, and also let's look into the future and say, what are we expecting when you go out there to the workplace, corporate and stuff like that? And I'm not chilling alone today. I'm chilling with my friend. I don't know if I should say best friend, but known this guy since first year, did our undergrad together. And we're here together now. We're just going to have a conversation about uni and high school and reflect on our personal experiences. Uh, let me just give him a chance to introduce himself who is Lungelo <laughs> and, and, and tell me who's Lungelo and how did we meet okay I mean it's an interesting story how we met but hey guys my name is Lungelo Sibanda mm -hmm. I am a mentor I have copious amounts of experience when it comes to mentorship but I mean that's also a conversation for another day I am an accountant. Well, not an accountant, but I study accounting. I feel like you're an accountant because I heard that once you get an undergrad, undergrad degree in accounting, you're an accountant. Okay, I guess yeah, we can settle on that. I, I do accounting you're not a general well. accountant, but you're an not accountant. Not yet, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess. Yeah, so how I met Blessing was quite a unique experience because I had just come out of high school and I'm trying to meet up with the best people, make the best networks ever. And when we got to, I know we were both staying at an undergrad rest, catering rest here at UCT. Um, and so <laughs> one of the things I was thinking to myself is how do I make this experience as best as possible? And obviously that would be associating with people that are uh, great and killing it out there. So I saw on his profile picture that he was one of the top achievers nationally. <laughs> He's a great guy. You can start clapping. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah. I saw that he was a top achiever and I was like, yeah, I mean, it would be great to have a conversation with this person because he's done so well. I'd like to find out more because I was a top achiever at my school too. So I just wanted to know what, what it takes to get to that level of achievement. So I popped him a message. I was like, hey, bro, saw that you were the top achiever. Congratulations. That kind of message, not glazing, but <laughs> I was just, yeah, 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 congratulating him for that and maybe just setting up a sort of mini talk with him. Yeah, yeah. And then we met when collecting our food because it was during COVID. Yeah. So we weren't allowed out of our rooms. We just had to stay in our own rooms for the entire time. Yeah. Exactly. It was We were quarantined. So this one time we met at the dining hall and we started having a normal conversation. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy because on the WhatsApp chats that we had, I think I got a semi-serious type of impression from him but when i met him i realized he was such a chill guy and it messed up with my mind i was like <laughs> I was going who is this that. guy <laughs> what was the first impression you like you meet this guy you'd be like what was the first impression the first impression was he likes to take his time i think that's what i noticed the most is he likes to take his time with things and he He's very laid back. <laughs> you know, when you say that, people always tell me that I can walk into an exam room five minutes before and I'm not even ready. I'm like, I'm no. so relaxed. I get yeah. there, put my bag proper. They say start the exam. I'm not even panicking. I'll take my time, write my name, do all those kind of things and then start yeah. writing. Because I feel like it doesn't help to panic. Like, it's like, yeah. we're here now. Why am I panicking? Yeah, you like, have a different level of composure. Because I remember this one time with an assignment I was doing. But, I mean, that's a story for another day. But which assignment? We were doing an information systems assignment. And I, I hate technology. I hate anything that yeah, has to I do with online that. stuff. And I knew he loved it. So, <laughs> I remember I going up to you and saying, bro, how did you do this? <laughs> and, yo. This is such a pain point for me because I still, to this day, don't understand how he did it. This guy, he looked at my code because I remember we were coding some HTML code. I mean, it's basic stuff, but for people who are not majoring in ComSci or, or chat, yeah, like, like computer stuff, it's difficult. And stuff like that. He looked at the code and he typed a few things out and it was fixed. It, it skipped my mind. Like, I couldn't make sense of it. It was a mystery. <laughs> and that's why, I mean... 
that's not to say I was dumb or I didn't know what I was doing. Nah, nah, nah. It's but not like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nah, like, it's how like did that. you do that? Yeah. Nah, I, I, feel, I feel like some people, it's just that thing of like, we keep that in different ways. Yeah. So I don't know when it comes to computers and stuff like that, I feel like I have that edge. I even got a class record for you. <laughs> See, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. One. That's what I'm talking about. For those who don't know, class record is where you like number one in the entire class. In and the entire like there's, course, yeah. There was more than 500 people in that IS course. You get yeah. like number one. And I remember telling my, back then I used to have a girlfriend, so I always help my girlfriend with information system. If she watches this, I helped her with the information system thing, right? Because I was good at that thing. And I remember... I found so much pleasure in doing information system because it was something that's like so practical to me. Okay, cool. Now we're coding this website. I want to do it. Now we're doing Excel. And if it doesn't work, it's more of like a challenge to me. Yo, this thing is not working. How can I solve that problem? Compared to other courses, let's go to accounting and stuff like that. I feel like it's so process driven that you just yeah. have to cram the process mm -hmm. and then. And I mean, you have to look back to your standard. You have your to handbooks. Your standard. You're not solving problems. You're just saying... You're applying principles that are preset. What are the principles? What's the standard saying? Let me just apply it. You're not yeah. solving a problem. So with coding, it's like you'll code something and then there's one small mistake. There's no standard for it. You have mm. to use your mind. You need to apply your mind to problem solve. I guess, I mean, that's also true for accounting because there's a certain level of judgment involved, especially as you progress. It's no longer just bookkeeping and recording the numbers. Yeah. Some yeah. decision making to do yeah but that's <coughs> the thing so we spoke about first impressions and it's crazy man yeah. your first boy let's talk about funny what was your impression of me when we first met yo it's crazy your impression so that's what i'm saying you're saying the first time we met it was at the dh and now i'm thinking i'm thinking the first time i remember meeting you we're not at the dh i remember we were chilling by the second floor I don't know how we got to chill in that common area in the second floor, but we were standing there. I don't know how we got there, but we were just having a conversation. It was you and Zota. That was the first time meeting Zota because you guys were na oh, yeah. neighbors. We were neighbors, yeah. We were neighbors. And we started chatting there. I think we stood there for like 30 minutes and stuff like that, just having a conversation, right? I was like, this guy, this brew, <laughs> you know, you know, a kasi, a kasi brew, you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can pick that up just by looking at them, that this guy is from... A cars, yeah. And tall. So my first impression is like, ah, lungi lungi mbona lo, was a cars. But the thing is, like, he had like sleek English. His English was proper. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, it was intimidating. That's great. <laughs> His English was proper. Like you from the hood, but your English is proper, right? And I understand now, because when I got to know you, I realized that you did English home language in like high school. That's what I'm saying. My first impression was like, you from the hood. I knew you from the hood. And in my head. I thought that you did English fall just like me, right? Oh, yeah. And then after some time, I think after like months, when I found out that you did English and home language, I was like, damn, that's why this guy was so sleek when it comes to it. Nah, but I don't, I don't think that explains it a lot. Because why? even in my high school, for example, we didn't speak English for normal conversations. But don't you think doing English home language kind of like broadens your vocab if i may say like you're exposed to more ways the kind of literature you read like short stories poems they deep and the way you just do language you know what's that paper paper one paper is language yeah it's paper one like paper one to you think like it challenges you more and you get to engage more into like this language english i mean i think yes it does in some part but i could make the same argument for english file Wait, so your English teacher, she was Zulu. Zulu. Yeah. In she taught car. English in Zulu. By the way, Miss Bats, if you see this, so please now, don't attack me. Now, now, now let's have that conversation because now I said your English was lead. Like, not lead. It was proper when I met you, right? So how yeah. do you think you were able to like develop that vocab? Yeah. And be able to speak and communicate in English? I think I think I had the privilege of being born at a time when it where the internet was pervasive. It was available mm. for everyone to see what's going on out in the world. And I had my first encounter with this guy, a legend I call, called Vusi Timbiwai. Oh, yeah, Vusi. Yeah, he, he's, he was such an inspiration to me in terms of how to speak and just how to deliver your 
myself and be articulated. So I just started reading more books and immersing myself in conversations, speaking English more, because I think the what matters is the practice you get from actually doing the thing than reading um, so who are you in English. Speaking to like you I was speaking to myself on the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> it's the mirror principle. It works. Nah, them, that's crazy. It's the mirror principle. <laughs> but yeah, also, like do, <laughs> do you think that, because I know with um, home language, yeah. the, the books that you guys read and the poems that you read have more like, we call it deep English to what we did in like first additional language. Yeah. Mm. Do you think that also contributed to your vocabulary? I think it contributed to my vocabulary, but not in a good way. And I'll tell you why. Because... It's not the day-to-day -day conversation in those books that you get. You don't get you don't get the English that you use okay. on the street. You get Shakespeare. You get Shakespeare <laughs> English, and it's not that. Shall I compare D to I a think, summer stay? <laughs> exactly, and I think that's where I went wrong with a lot of my approaches to yeah. conversations with people because I'd use deep words and people wouldn't understand. And yeah, so I remember from my personal experience, and I was doing first year uh, at, at UCT. Keep in mind, I, I also did like English uh, first additional. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it's not about uh, what you're exposed to, but about the practice. Because mm. I call it textbook English because you can read as many books as you want. You know, you can be exposed like, you know, to all the different types and levels of English. But if you, if you don't know how to have a good conversation, it, it's pointless which is you where know? it starts i mean the exactly practice. Yeah. yeah so when i was doing first year i got to uct you know when i was still in high school almost all my friends it was a, a group of five we always spoke english in school mm. you know so everyone thought oh this you know these cool kids they're making themselves uh you know better and stuff but then we always spoke english but when i got here i felt like it, i didn't know english you know, and I had to start from scratch. And it's this mirror principle you're talking about that it's constant practice. Yeah. You know, just because you know English doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to have a good conversation in English. You know how to have a sense of humor in English. Yeah. If you can't tell a joke in English, exactly. people laugh. You don't know English. And I think <laughs> that's what messes up initiating relationships yeah, in true. adversity because we can't translate ourselves to yeah. English. It's like, yeah. yeah I, I usually speak in Zulu, but now how do I communicate with people in English such that yeah. it doesn't take away from who I am? Like, yeah. I still make an impression yeah. of myself yeah. as genuinely as I can. Yeah. I, I remember, yo, I was, I was this guy. <laughs> you know those guys that you chill with these kids from, like, private schools? <laughs> All of them are busy speaking English. Yeah, bro. <laughs> and everyone is laughing, you know, the mood is high, everyone is saying... <laughs> and then you talk when and the, that, and the mood just goes down. <laughs> You're the reason why. It's like, yeah, you're the reason. <laughs> you it's kill like, the humor. It's like, you, the situation is not funny anymore. And, and you, you were trying to add. Yeah. You were trying to add you're value. To say, and you end up keeping quiet in most cases. Mm. Until like, yo, okay, you don't want to speak because when you speak here, yeah, yeah. you just kill the mood. And it's this whole thing about, you know, textbook English. If, if you, can, you can read as many books as you want. But the most important thing is, can you practice? Can you actually have a conversation? Can you sit down with someone and speak for like hours, you know? And I feel like the more you get used to it, I got to a point where even now, like uh, with my girlfriend. Or, like, Why are you hesitating? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a thing that, you know, a lot of people, especially who know me personally, when I speak Isi Zulu, like my home language, they become shocked. They're like, hey, you can speak Isi Zulu because I'm always speaking English when I'm with them. And that's the practice mm. that I've managed to, uh, to, to build. And uh, it takes time. You know, it's not just about book. You can do first language, fit, like home language, yeah. and file as well. But if you don't practice and have like actual conversations, it's useless at the but, end of the day. But yeah. he, here's the thing: I feel like you also touched on this thing of girlfriend and stuff like that. Yeah. So coming to varsity, do you think that language barrier kind of like sabotages some of your relationship yeah. or your? potential relationships you're like you meet a girl yeah and now just because you can't tell a joke in english like a proper joke in english yeah. you lose out have you ever had that experience well personally <laughs> no <laughs> or even if i have i don't think i'd be disclosing that here <laughs> yeah uh, but i mean <laughs> that's a proper thing with tiktok <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The language barrier is always there. And especially from a guy that comes from the hood. Yeah, yeah. From you come country. here, you get with... You, you see girls that come from all girls' schools. The they spoke thing. English their entire lives. Sometimes even the stuff they say you don't understand, but yeah. you have to roll in they with it because you can't they exactly. Jokes. I, this, this I, I'll tell I, a story about this one girl. No, it's cool. Yeah, go, let's hear the story. Let's hear the story. <laughs> like, let's hear, I, 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 I also have a story about this one girl, but you can you can go first. There's this one girl. Um, when I was in my first year. Yeah. Who? Okay, so I let me tell you a backstory about how we met. Yeah. So I got her contacts. There was a games night. Mm. Games night happened, and then we got over that one of my friends took her contact but he figured out that he wasn't that interested in her so he passed the contact to me because mm. i thought yeah now nah, that girl looked really good so i i reached out to her via phone <laughs> and then arranged for us to meet up and she was like yeah, yeah cool we can meet up and we did meet up and then we walked up i remember we went to middle campus which is a campus that's at gct and so we were having a conversation about just general life and just getting to know each other 90% of that conversation, I wasn't understanding what she was saying. <laughs> but I was, I, I mean, I did a pretty good job pretending I did understand what was going on. And I mean, she was still interested in me after all. Which I mean, I think is a good thing. What happened after that conversation? Did, what happened? I tried. <laughs> what, what happened? Where did it end? Nah, hey, uh, that's a painful one. We can't, <laughs> I can't disclose that well, one. I can't disclose that one. But I can't catch you. Yeah. So, so, so. Nah, but but, but my, my <laughs> so my sto- I I think I know who you're talking. <laughs> you're yeah, referring probably to, that's crazy. Person. So so my <clears throat> story is so this other girl. I don't know if this games are common or whatever it is. You know how if me and you we say the same thing at the same time, right? And mm-hmm. I can say you owe me a coke. Jinx. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, yeah, you're like you Jinx. owe me a coke. They they say they owe me a coke. So I'm sitting with this girl, and then we say something at the same time and it's like you owe me a coke i'm like what the fuck? <laughs> oh, you owe me a coke? like i didn't understand what she was saying right and then she had to explain to me it's like nah whenever you say something like at the same time with someone and they say you owe me a coke you need to buy them a coke young daughter i'm like i didn't know that <laughs> like because we don't you don't we don't experience those kind of things we don't expose those kind of things yeah I feel like now we're going on a tangent but it's cool <laughs> it's cool we'll cut it out let, 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 let's talk about uh, let's talk about our academic journey, basically, right? Uh, so let's talk about from high school going to university. Yeah. Like, you mentioned that in your high school you were a top achiever. Like, how did you manage to be a top achiever in high school? I just did it. <laughs> I know that's a shallow <laughs> answer, but yep. in many regards, I mean, there were three of us that mm. were always competing for the high spot. Yeah. And I remember for maybe from grade 8 to grade 10, Mm. There was this one boy that we were always swapping positions. Mm. Who, who is my friend? Um, he used to get number one sometimes. I used to get number one. So we were just alternating. Mm. But then from grade 11 going to matric, I was taking all the accolades. And I don't think I can... I mean, I think it it depends on the mindset that you have when approaching your academics. And I think that mindset gains, gets reinforced for students that perform well. But the opposite mindset also gets reinforced to students that don't perform well. So it's quite interesting yeah, yeah, because true. that also causes, I think is the reason why students that perform well tend to get all the accolades all the time. And students that don't perform well don't think they can do better than the yeah, but I, the ones that... So I have <clears throat> three comments, questions. Yeah. Comments slash questions. The first question is, do you think the competition because you mentioned that you're always swapping po- spots yeah do you think the competition helped you into like always trying to be the best version of yourself always trying to be that number one right because today we're getting awards that boy is taking it you're like nah next time i'll make sure that he doesn't take it i take it mm-hmm. do you think it contributed to you always wanting to be there like as i want to be the top achiever yes it did a lot a lot contributed a lot because um, people are there for the show too. They're there to see who's getting what and um, how well are they performing. So I guess the pressure of performing well came with also knowing how capable my opponents at the time. It was a healthy competition because we helped each other um, mm-hmm. through all the subjects that we did. So 
both of us were just heavily invested in our studies. And because I knew how capable my opponents, I'll call them, were, I just put my A game in all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think it did contribute. Because I feel like that's powerful. Because I feel like for me, in high school, the competition also contributed to me like going hard, mm. right? I'd wake up at 2 a.m. because I know that I don't want that guy to be the one who's taking all the awards. Whoa. I want to be there as well, right? But when I came to university, it's like a change in, change in like mentality or stuff like that. Because mm-hmm. it's like for me, school is no longer like the end goal or whatever it is, right? Mm. But I want to get great marks. It's just that I'm not committing to anyone else. I'm just doing me. I yeah. did continue co- getting like great marks, but it's just always I'm, the competition is with me rather than the next person. Yeah. I think right. when you get to varsity, you start considering so many other things that great marks alone aren't the, aren't the primary yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think for some people, great marks are still the primary thing. Yeah, because they focus on that. For me, it was yeah. okay, cool. I'm also focusing on entrepreneurship because now I'll have a conversation. I know a guy who's like always the top achiever in our class, right? Mm-hmm. And I have a conversation with him and I realize that this guy is so focused on academics alone and you get blessing and focused on this entrepreneurship pursuit. Now I want to do a podcast. Now I want to do this. Now I want to do this. Now I want to do that, right? And I can't compare my marks to that guy because he spends 100% of his time on academics. I spent 30% of my time on academics and then the rest of the time I'm trying to do what? Balance the other well, why don't you make the same argument for students that don't get as great marks as you do, but spend 100% of their time now that's studying? A debate. Now, that's a debate for another day. But I feel like, like you said, you also mentioned this. <laughs> 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 there are three types of people. First ones, the natural smart. Second type is... Hard workers. They hard workers. Yeah. If they put on the time, They'll get it. they can get it. And then the third ones, no matter how hard they try... They won't get it at all, Doesn't right? Take. Which is something that we must come to terms with and say. But I feel like the third ones, the reason why they're not getting it at all, is not because they they not dumb. smart. Yeah, it's because they're in a field whereby they're not supposed to be there. Yeah, right. They give that in other aspects. It's just that now they're in a field whereby they're not supposed to be there. You're supposed to be a musician. You're supposed to be an artist. But why you didn't do art because your parents told you that go be an actual sciences what what imagine go be an accountant if you went and did art you're gonna be top of your class because you're talented in that who's that guy who's that guy uh steve 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 harvey he always says this always make sure that you prioritize your talent and it shall make room for you because your talent is something you do with the least amount of effort yeah if you and do I... something with the least amount of effort you'll You'll always be able to get great marks. <laughs> you get great marks. You'll always be able to outperform each and every person in the room. Yeah, and I, I feel a deep sense of sympathy for students that don't get the chance to explore different uh, parts of life in their high school journeys. For example, doing sports and doing different forms of art because they aren't able to discover their talents until later in, on in life. Yeah, yeah, true. So true. that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's such a difficult that's, thing because that, public say, schools are just focused on education. That's it. That's why, that's why I say my entire purpose in life is to kind of like, I don't know, before I die, one thing I want to do is to make sure that I restructure the education system, right? Mm-hmm. I want to restructure the education system because I feel like it's so narrow that it's either this part or nothing else. We don't consider the people who are there. Like you go to high schools, you have, let's say, 100% of the students. Only 2% are gifted when it comes to maths and science, but they all have to do maths and science. Apparently, they are told that maths and science is the measure to success. If you can pass maths and science, you want to get into a good degree, get great marks, pass, get a good job. But we don't consider that there's someone who's there who's an artist, there's someone who's there who's supposed to be a rapper, there's someone who's there who's supposed to be something. So if we can restructure the whole education system to cater to those different students, yeah. then we'd have <clears throat> done our job. And I don't think that the damage that this is doing is quantified correctly. And what I mean by that is in, in making it compulsory to do math and science for all students, regardless of what talents you have, not only are you saying well, for the students that do well in medicine science, yeah, you have a great career ahead of you. You're also saying to the students that 
is not great in math and science, there is nothing you can do with your life. You, you are, you are reinforcing the belief that they can't do feel, it. And I feel like that has been my biggest thing because go to go to public schools. I don't know if it's the same in private schools and stuff yeah. like that. But I completely believe it's not the same in pub in private schools. Yeah. And here's my thing. Go to a public school, right? Mm, yeah. The teachers there, they always put those kids who are like top achievers in like pedestal. Yeah. They're yeah. like, you guys are here. And the rest are ah, you guys are just failures. The stories they tell <laughs> they'll be like they'll be like, if a kid is doing something shady, they say, When well, we know that you're gonna one day you're gonna wash Blessing's car. Because Blessing, Blessing is the top achiever in class. Yeah. So they already have that thing that Blessing is going to be successful. This kid, because he's not getting great marks, he's not going to be successful. He's going to wash Blessing's car. And this is a belief that gets reinforced. That's the thing. And then those kids, they get to believe that we're not successful. We're not good enough. I, re I remember in my metric, uh, so one of my math teachers, this guy, there was this time he sat, uh, he sat on the table, he was speaking to the whole class, and he was like, guys, you know that you kind of feel people what of that, you know, because <laughs> because you guys, all of you guys, like obviously there was like the smart group as a saying. They knew that okay, you know, these three, four guys, they always top of the class, but then everyone else is gonna fail the paper, yeah. you know. So he was like, you know what, just focus on question one. So <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wanted to He's say like, the name because I know you. Talk, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> he was like, he was like, just focus on question one, you know, just master so for X and make sure that you get all the marks you can get there. Wow. It just shows how they instilled it, this mindset that, you know what, you're not going to make it. I don't care how hard you try. I don't care how much time we put in, but you're just not going to make it because you're not part of this group of students mm. that have been excelling. You know, And it's just crazy how it's like everyone has accepted it and they make it normal. Yeah. Like, okay, you know what, uh, there are these top three students or learners are all passing, but then everyone else, uh, good you luck. You guys are going to be failures in life. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. like my kind of like purpose in life to change the entire thing and say we all there's this famous quote i don't know who said that quote but you say if you judge a fish by its ability to fly or to climb a tree if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree then it, it will never know something about the yeah, ocean yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know about the ocean but it will never know its ability or it always be a fail or something like that because yeah, yeah, yeah. a fish can't climb a tree so I feel like the education system is like that. But now I feel like we'll be jumping too deep into politics because I feel like the problem stems from like our governing party the and system. how they're running the entire education, education system. system yeah. Because if you go to private school, I strongly believe that there's something that private schools are doing that public schools are not. That's what makes them private. But they pay. Cause but also coming from someone who has an experience of both private and uh, public, you know, I've, I was one person I, I, who... I feel like we should give context to it. Okay. When did you go to private school? When did you go to <laughs> public school? Okay, so... So that we understand. For most part of my primary, mm -hmm. so up until like grade seven, mm. I was in a private school. And then for my high school, I went to a public school. Mm. So one thing I've always wanted to do was to play cricket. And you found that that thing was only provided in at private a private school. school. Yeah, yeah. And... Now, here's my parents who are like, nah, we're no longer seeing the value of you, of, going, to of you going to private school. Because look at the kids in the public schools who are performing exceptionally so. And then they move me from like a private school to a public school because they want to see an excellent student in me. The reason why I'm bringing this up, I feel like sometimes it's more on the background and the society that we come from. For example, if my parents don't believe that I could be a cricket player, there's no way where they could provide a platform for me. <laughs> I feel like that. Hey, no, I'm gonna make a dumb comment because I always have like, <laughs> always have like dumb things to say. Because <laughs> I feel like sometimes you know in life. Me as yes, bless you, I can think I'm so good at something. <laughs> but the people around me they can yes. never see. see. <laughs> like they can see. And, like, and sometimes you must believe the opinions of other people. Like my mom can never lie to me. He can never say I'm not good at this thing if I'm good at it. Like he can never lie. But, like but don't I'll, you think it's because from her generation this was being a cricket player was never praised more than being a doctor. 
there's also that conversation. Have they seen I, you playing cricket? Probably not. Have they seen? even never come to support. Yeah, exactly. So I guess but it's I can, more, I can it's have another question. Were you excelling? Were you the top dog when it comes to cricket? <laughs> Did you I get mean, awards? I got, I got, Did you get awards? Yes, like I was even called for provincial level. Oh. But now the thing is, to them, it's not a, 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 a point of success. It's just a matter it's of a belief like, thing. Yeah. Yes. Cricket is a hobby, something you do for fun. It's not. So don't you think all this? It's not a commercial comes, enterprise. Comes from how our backgrounds, uh, um, from the backgrounds you actually come from. Because you see, when you go to your cities, such thing is accommodated. But when you're back at home, high blessing. You can only be a chartered accountant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, f- I feel like it's the same thing that we were talking about. That I feel like they have this standard measure of success, right? For them, it's like school or nothing. For them, it's math or science or nothing. Mm. It's either you become an accountant, doctor. Even this thing of accountant, I feel like it came into popularity now. For them, back then, it was like you're a doctor, you're an engineer, those famous careers and stuff like that. But obviously, there are those that pop out now and then, like an accountant and stuff like that. It's like now, if you say, Mom, I want to go and study music, I think it's going to be a long debate. Because now they're saying, music, nah, music is a hobby. Like, it's not something that you need to study. Uh, but now, now, let's chat about, you said you were a top achiever in high school, uh, top achiever in university. <laughs> 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 nah, but, but now, let's talk about, like, study techniques. Uh time management tips, mm-hmm. those kind of things, like productivity tips, right? Yeah. Because I'm only <clears throat> sharing like productivity tips for students, academic coaching tips or whatever on TikTok and stuff like that. And I always get this comment, you blessing. I feel like that thing will only works for you, right? And that would yeah. be cool. I think, I mean, should I start, uh, start answering? No, no, but, but yeah, let me, let me finish my question. Cool, cool. But it's a bit of like, most of the times when people say that it's just that the tips that I share, most of the times they're backed up by research. So what I do is I read a lot of books, right? I read, I read a lot of productivity books. And then now they mention this certain technique, or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Or system. And I go and implement it myself. And I'm like, yeah, this thing works. And then I go and share it out there, right? Or sometimes I share the things that have worked for me from personal experience and understand that it might work for me, it might not work for you. Yeah. Like, listen to th- study music when you're studying. Mm-hmm. It works for me. Some people like complete silence. They yeah. don't want to hear any sound when they're studying. Mm-hmm. It works for me. I want sound, stuff like that. So I just want us to chat about study techniques and study tips. In high school, let's reflect. Let's go back to high school. What do you think you did? What do you think you implemented for you to always be a top achiever? Going to university, what are the things that you think that worked for you? What are the things that you think they didn't work for you in a way? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. But I think this tips and productivity techniques thing is an overglorified sort of, I'd say, pursuit because... People who are good at stuff, regardless of what you do in the morning, if you pray and you meditate <laughs> and you take a cold shower, if you're good at your craft, you know, you're just good. You know what he's saying? There's a thing about a conversation we're having about our gym coaches and say they're taking steroids and then they can't they say they can get new results, <laughs> but they know what are they drinking steroids, they're exactly. injecting and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, if I look back to my high school, I was just putting in the work. I can't point it towards one specific thing that I was doing that gave me the upper hand in terms of my performance or just leverage. But, but here's my thing. Here's my entire argument, right? So I always preach this thing of Pomodoro technique. Right? That's something you also discovered way after you, let me, you yeah, matriculated. Yeah, let me, let, me give you, let me give you a thing. Let but you were a top achiever in your matric. Nah, let me, I, That's I, interesting. I, I, always, I always say this, right? Yeah. In high school... I always used the Pomodoro technique, but I didn't know, you didn't know about it. Yeah. Pomodoro technique. I always said, okay, cool. I'm gonna set 40 minutes, 45 minutes timer, work, and then take a five minutes break and go back. I don't know where I learned this technique, but I knew that it existed, right? And I was applying it every time, and it worked for me. I remember I always say the only reason why I'd study three days before the exam and pass and be able to study eight hours a day is because I'd apply the Pomodoro technique. 
I started mm. for the five minutes, take a five minutes break. But back in high school, I didn't know that it's called a Pomodoro technique. Until when I did research, reading multiple books, and I realized, oh, they call it the Pomodoro technique. There's actually a book. The guy published a book. I think it was, I don't remember the year. Yeah. But he published a book on the Pomodoro technique. Mm -hmm. So through me researching, reading multiple books, I realized it's the Pomodoro technique, but it worked. That's why I share the tips that I share. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I've been using this tip. I guess the one working. The what one is the Pomodoro technique for someone who doesn't know? Yeah, but Pomodoro technique is basically you uh, splitting your work into blocks, work, focus blocks. So what you're basically doing is saying, I'm going to set a 45 minutes timer, focus session whereby I work. If you're studying, 45 minutes, you're studying, you're strongly studying. And then when the timer goes off, you take a five minutes break, you relax, you stretch, you take a walk just to relax and get your energy level back up. And then after you go back to another 45 minute cycle. So it's a cycle, right? Basically, the reason, and there's research about it. There's a yeah. professor, but he talks about how the more you work in economics, they call it the law of diminishing marginal returns. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> the more you work, the more your focus level declines. Mm -hmm. So they say the human brain can only focus for an average of like 25 minutes, right? So you work for, the more you, 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 when you exceed 25 minutes, your focus level starts to decline. They start to decline. So whatever you're doing, as much as you're studying, whatever, you're not retaining the information anymore because now your focus levels are down. But if you take a break, a five minutes break, mm. that's proven that it's going to increase your focus levels back. It's going to re-energize you and then you'll be able to focus again for the next 25 minutes block. Yeah. So they're saying Pomodoro technique is basically you working in blocks. Not straight out. You can't study for four hours straight with no break. You but can. Once, once you start taking breaks, mm. then you're able to energize and go back to the same focus level. I think. I think when when giving people tips for how to maximize their academic performance or just how to improve their performance in general, the one important formula that you should never ever forget in your life is this: the most important thing ever is the Greek maxim, know thyself. Know thyself means knowing what works for you and what doesn't. And I mean, going back to your point of the Pomodoro technique, I didn't know it in high school. I got exposed to it when I got to varsity. I tried to use it, but personally, again, it, it's not something I'd say works for me because sometimes I get locked into a task so much that I can go for three hours without a break, but I'd still be functioning. Uh, and so, I mean, those are nuances that you need to take note of in terms of yeah. knowing yourself. That's why I always say people who are sharing tips online, it's not a matter of like, this thing is going to work for everyone. Standard, yeah. Right? You, we're sharing it for our next level. Mm. I've read multiple books, right? I've got a lot of tips. I've tried some of them. And after trying them for like a week, a month, I realized that mm, this thing is not working for me and then I can drop back. So when you're sharing mm. tips, it's a matter of saying, I want to give you this plug. Try it out. If it doesn't work for you, stop. Mm. Don't force. But now I'm interested in you. Ah, I don't think there's someone who can work for four hours without a break. Three hours without a break. Ah, I, I, can, I, can, I mean, I can, sometimes <laughs> I can't be like locked that. in. I can't three be locked into a task a without a break. Nah, I mean, you write, a, you write an exam for three hours without a break. So what stops you from nah. studying when, for three hours you? without a break? Nah. Part of studying is writing practice tests. And I guess... If it ain't that exam... It could take longer. I have a different opinion. In that exam, you have a break. There's a time where you stop and you just look at people and you're like, yo, <laughs> are these people writing correct things or not? Because oh, that's a break. Your but, mind can't... But it's not a conscious break to say five minutes, okay, I'm resting now. I'm, yeah, yes, it is a break, it but... It shows that your mind needs a break sometimes. You can't think of something consistently for three hours straight out. At yeah, but point, when I say three hours, I'm not saying to... I'm, I'm looking at my paper three hours straight. That's what I'm saying. But it's also not I'm focused for 40 minutes and I'm, then I'm going to take the five minutes But that's what I'm saying. Next. That's the entire point of Pomodoro. That your mind needs a break at some point. So you need to push until the point where you see that I hear I'm playing. Let me take a five minutes break. That's why whenever I'm preaching Pomodoro, I'm saying the standard, when that guy published his first book, the standard was 25 minutes, five minutes break, if I remember properly. It's either 25, five minutes break, or 25, 30 minutes break, right? Well, yeah. But I remember it was 25 minutes focus sessions. Mm -hmm. But you know yourself, if you know that you can push for 60 minutes focus sessions, mm -hmm. do that. If you know that you can push for one hour, 30 minutes focus sessions, do that. But the most important thing is at some point, you need a break. 
and mm. you taking that break is more important than you forcing to continue. And that's the thing. I mean, the three hours, I wouldn't be forcing myself to do the work. I'd just be zoned in so much that I've lost a sense of time. And boom, three hours have gone past. Yeah, I know. I've gone by. I get you. The screen is yeah. off. Screen but is I'd off, probably man. say the one productivity tip that I was using also in high school um, and probably didn't know about it and yes, what it was called huh? is the active recall. I don't know if you've heard of active yeah, recall. Heard of re yeah, that's what I was doing what, in high what, school. What, what, what's active recall? So active recall is know. when you... So that's basically where you read through a set of information and then you try and regurgitate it using your own words. And I mean, that's also an effective note-taking um, strategy to say, if I really understand it, then I can put it into my own words and I can explain it to someone else and I can test whether I truly understand it by, by doing that. Um, and, and how did that change when you came to university? With univer it's interesting because <laughs> at university, there's just so much information. One, it's difficult to take... It's difficult to take detailed notes of every module that you do. So I guess you need to make some sort of trade-off when it comes to taking notes and how you learn the information. Because you need to learn it so fast that you can't take detailed notes for every single subject matter. Yeah, I guess that's the one thing that I've, I've had to work on, yeah, optimizing. Sure, sure that's the next <laughs> thing we need to talk about, like uh, the journey uh, moving from high school to university. What are some of the challenges that you've experienced and how was the shift from high school to university? Okay, so the one, <laughs> I think it's an, it's a pervasive challenge that a lot of high school top achievers, maybe a few, maybe not a lot, but I've had a personal experience with this, failing a test. Hmm. It's interesting because I've never failed at all <laughs> in my high in school. High school yeah. I've never failed. So it's a shocker when it happens at varsity and you realize, oh, when you've actually put an effort into something and it doesn't go as well as you thought it would. And then it hits your mind. It's like, okay, what exactly is going on? Or, or sitting in an exam and not being sure what you're writing. I've never had that happen in an exam before. Hmm. It happened when I got to varsity where I'm thinking to myself, yo, I don't know the answer to this. Mm. I'd usually ask myself in high school, how do people not get this? It's simple. <laughs> but now I sit in an exam and I'm like, yo, yeah, this, this is something <laughs> else. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this, this, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, so that's the, I mean, that's the biggest challenge I've had. And asking for help. Yes. In high school, I've never had to ask for help because I always was able to make sense of things. Mm. Um, but I've got to varsity, and when you do stuff, even when you see the solution right there in front of you, you don't know what's you don't know how they got there. <laughs> I, so you have to ask the question. Yeah, let's talk about you failing the first test. Well, yeah. the first test you failed, <laughs> and what mark do you get? <laughs> let's let's chat about that. It was a it was a it was a TAT test that we wrote in my first year. Um, it was EBM. EBM. Evidence-based management. Yeah. yeah, it was some course. I didn't like it. Still don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny? You know what's funny? I think I remember <laughs> <laughs> I think you even emailed a tutor on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I was know. shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. I didn't, I didn't believe it. I don't know how I felt here. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I I took my time writing this thing. I got below fifty. Yeah, yeah. I no, I, we're actually together when we saw my mark, so he knows. I got I got forty five out of a hundred. I actually laughed, but that day I think I got forty one. <laughs> but I laughed. <laughs> I like this Bruce got a year in the election. But I feel like my side I understood because I didn't. Even, it didn't I didn't, do yeah, I didn't for put it. that much effort. Yeah. I wrote that thing like a few hours before it was due and submitted. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, that's the thing. So. For you, it's failing for the first time. Yeah. And also this thing asking of for asking help. for help. Yeah. And also not knowing, being in an exam not and you're knowing. like, I don't yeah. know, whatever it is. So if, it, if there was one thing that you would say to people who are like in high school right now coming to varsity, yeah. like what would you say to them? How do they tackle those type of challenges? Not knowing when you're in an exam, you're like, I don't know, whatever I have to write, yeah? Or... Asking for help, how can they ask for help? 
how can you ask for help? Make the decision to ask for help. Um, I think I, I've had ask? to reflect. I, I've had to reflect for myself, like in terms of asking for help, because I realized I usually make my decisions based on cost benefit analysis. So it's like, what's the cost of asking for help? Am I losing anything from doing that? And am I benefiting more than I'm losing? Mm. If if my ego gets bruised because I'm asking for help, does my ego is is my ego worth more than me learning? Right. Mm. You need to ask yourself that question, and the answer to it is usually no, it's not. Um, and you have to make the right decision then, and and go out and ask for help. Yeah, that's that's powerful. But I feel like for me, uh, for me in high school, you know, in high school we're like one of the top achievers. And you always up there, right? And people mm-hmm. are always asking you for help. Mm. So you used to that people are always asking you for help. But coming to varsity, that's my personal experience. I came to varsity, came to UCT, and I'm like, I know at UCT it's like the smartest people ever. For you to get into UCT, <coughs> you, must, you must be among the smartest people. So yeah. for me, coming to uni, I've never had a problem with asking someone if I don't get something, help me out. Because mm. I feel like I know you're the smartest person as well. The fact that you're here, that means you're smart, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't mind asking you for help. And like, Yo, if I don't know something, let me ask you out and you help me out. And I mm-hmm. always preach this, that it's time for you to spend three hours trying to figure out something if you can just ask someone and then they explain it to you in less than 10 minutes and then you're done. You move on with your life. Yeah, That's dumb. That's the dumbest thing ever. That's why when I preach study smart and not hard, that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we'll we'll get into the conversation of study smart, say, not hard. I say study smart, not hard. Yeah. If you can spend something three hours trying to figure some, like if you, maybe let's say you have a math problem and then you're struggling with that thing. It's past two hours now. You're still struggling with a thing. Move on. Go and ask someone else. Yeah. Because you can't spend the whole day trying to solve one problem. In that exam, you don't get one problem. You get multiple problems. Mm. If this one is giving you a problem, just ask. Someone will explain to you and then you can move on with your life to other stuff. Right, mm-hmm. that's the whole point of me saying you must study smart and not hard. But yeah, but just to, just to add on a little bit on what you've just said, study hard, study smart, not hard. Right, and if you're struggling with a problem, reach out to someone who does know it so that they explain to you. Sometimes I feel, and this obviously is is a nuance to the study smart, not hard um, argument to say if you don't know something, ask. To me, I've always had to grapple with the question and be content in the effort and the due diligence I've done trying to figure it out myself before I go on to someone to ask. Because sometimes I feel that as, as students, you want to ask someone a question that you haven't even attempted or you haven't really done much yeah, but trying to get the answer. But yes, the so thing. it's like... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You shouldn't just look at a question and say, I'm going to ask someone. That's to fit the whole purpose of learning and stuff like that. So the first thing is obvious, you sit down, try something out. If you feel like this thing, you're really struggling with it, just write whatever you're writing down. Write your thoughts down and say, cool, this is how I was going to approach this thing if I was in an exam and there was no one to ask. This is what I'm going to write. This is what I was going to write down. Right? Exactly. And after writing that thing down, when you go and ask someone, you're like, oh, so I'm struggling with this thing. This, this is, is what, what I, I did. Exactly. And then they can give you comment. Okay, cool. This is where you went wrong. That's the best way to learn because you're saying I wrote this but in contracts I was supposed to do this yeah but I I think that's omitted in your advice to say study hard study smart not hard don't spend three hours on a question I say spend two hours on something yeah spend two hours on something trying to do it if you feel like you're failing go and ask someone and actually try to do it Hmm. yeah you should actually try to do it don't just don't just say okay I see this thing I won't be able to do it and then go ask Actually, try to yeah, do you, it. Have an yes, attempt. You try to do it. You can thought you process can for two hours and yeah. just look at something and not do anything. Okay, you need to write sense. something down. But yeah, sure. so now, yeah, we spoke about uni life, and I feel like we didn't even dive deep into yeah. like uni life and the challenges that you faced. Because now you're telling me about academics and stuff like that, and I feel like <laughs> I was interested in tapping into like life problems beside academics like social life uh like let's talk about girls let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about relationships like 
What was the challenge coming to university? How I, was it like approaching your first girl? Man, that's that's what it, you know, <laughs> you know, if, if you're in high school and you're a top achiever, you get all yeah. the girls. Yeah, it's an automatic. That's, the, you know? that's that's <laughs> such a mental shift. It's difficult yeah. to make to make peace with. Because in high school, all these girls look up to you and they're like, oh, we want that guy is the smartest. But when you get to varsity, you have all these smart guys and now it's like all of you are average. That, so and, and I feel like in varsity, something else that's needs what to be considered. care about, about being smart in yeah. school. It doesn't, doesn't pay for the bill when you go to a restaurant. Does <laughs> it? Does We're it. all smart. <laughs> <laughs> now, I feel like they realize that being smart is... It's not the thing. So you can be smart, but that's not like success. That's not you being well off. You can't give them like a proper life with just being smart. Yeah, I know you're going to probably give me a better life when you have that job, when you're a CA. But you're not there yet. But you're not there yet. Relax. Now I'm going to run with the people who are there yet. <laughs> and then when you get there, we'll have that conversation. Mm, okay. For now, <laughs> relax, relax, boy. Focus on your studies. <laughs> but yeah, we're cool. Now let's talk about let's talk about post grad. Let's talk about post grad. Post grad. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're done with uh, your degree now. Doing post grad mm-hmm. and doing post grad in accounting. Doing post grad yeah, in accounting. Yeah. Post grad in accounting. PGTA. That's what they call it. The mm, UCT. Yeah. Other universities they call it CTA. CTA certificate. Certif- theory of accounting, theory of accounting, theory of accounting. Okay. and some people call it uh, GDA. They don't have the P. Graduate, yeah, graduate diploma, in diploma in accounting. And so, what's GDA basically, and how was the shift from undergrad in accounting to PGDA? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a really good question. So, GDA is a course. I think it's a a couple levels above undergrad accounting in terms of complexity and just depth of testing. I think when you do your undergrad, um, the focus on the subjects that you do, usually the big, the big four are usually the focus, accounting, management accounting, financial tax, accounting, tax, governance, um, governance and auditing, some call it auditing. So I think the focus area in your undergrad will usually just be understanding the principles and being, apply, being able to apply them as they are, mm. right? Just be able to pick it out of a scenario when you're given a scenario and just apply it, apply yourself or apply what you've been taught. When you get to GDA, there's a slight change in the level of complexity and the depth of questioning. So not only is it difficult to spot principles that are being diffi- uh, being tested, it's also difficult to apply them because you need to apply them uniquely, right? So I'll give an example. For example, if you're doing auditing, um, you have to pick some things out of the scenario itself. Let's say you're given a piece of a case, for example, mm-hmm. given a case, and you have to pick out certain things and triggers that will help you answer a question. So picking those que- um, those triggers is the difficult part, but also applying them in a way that guarantees you a mark. Um, I guess there are nuances in the way you're supposed to structure your, your responses. Yeah, yeah. So that's been a very difficult thing. But also the workload. Um, <laughs> yeah. The workload, the workload is crazy. <laughs> For example, just to give you a sense of what happens, you are expected to learn an entire module. Well, it depends what module it is because some get more weeks than others. So you are expected to learn an entire module in a, a week or so. A week or two. A week or two. And what do you get for that? You usually get one, two hours of worth of a lecture. And so there's two hours worth of a lecture for that specific module. Um, once in a week. So you basically sit down with the lecture for two hours and the rest of the learning you have to do by yourself, which is quite interesting. But yeah, yeah it's true. It was powerful. I feel like we'll have the conversation about lectures the other day. <laughs> Another day, because see, hey, I don't like lectures, <laughs> but yeah, it's cool, yeah. it's cool. I don't want but, to get fired. <laughs> but one thing that I would ask from both of you guys, since one is doing honors and the other one is in GDA, like, what do you think would have made you get more prepared for your postgrad or your honors in accounting now that you are in the program itself from undergrad? Uh, so I start with that. I feel like I start with explaining what's the difference between honors and accounting, right? Mm-hmm. Honors and PGDA G- or GDA or CTA. So PGDA, basically what they do is they do the four major accounting courses, management accounting, governance, Auditing, auditing and tax tax and yeah financial reporting that's what they do 
And with honors, you basically have an additional course where by doing research, you can choose any research area in accounting, whether it's tax, accounting, education in accounting, whatever it is. So basically you do research and you dive into that. And to answer your question, what would prepare you? I feel like for me, it's just being dedicated and saying accounting is the thing that you want to do. Because I feel like if you love accounting, you're saying my end, end goal is to be a CA, from undergrad, you're engaging with the content as it is. Because what I've realized is that this is my personal thing, right? Undergrad, I've never done pre readings or whatever it is. I've never read the God test book, whatever it is. But if you check when you get to CTA, most of the things that they're teaching is basically something that you are supposed to do in undergrad, right? It's the same topics, it's just that now they're teaching them in depth. So in undergrad, if you are reading your test books, if you're reading your pre readings, then you'll be able to survive. PGDA because yeah. now they're just going into depth and the test book already has that depth. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's the thing, you engaging with whatever learning material they gave you, which also is another challenge because I'm saying in undergrad, where do you get the time to do all those pre readings that they give you? A lecture will say read four chapters in a week. Is that possible for all the other courses that you do? You're doing seven courses, you still yeah. have to do two chapters in a week, mm -hmm. which is practically impossible. But I feel like for you to be well prepared is you engaging with everything. If they say, do these lectures, if you make sure that you undergrad, you're diligent and you're putting in the work properly when you get to postgrad, as much as it's a jump, but you'll still be able to manage because you were able to grasp those basic principles, those important principles. Mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? Then you trying to be in postgrad, you're taking the content, but you have to go back and try to fix those gaps that you have from undergrad. I feel like that's where the problem starts. Yeah. He, he's the master of yapping. <laughs> 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 he just yapped an entire <laughs> advice. But I mean, I'd say when you asked that question, I thought of exactly the same thing. Do your undergrad diligently. Like, mm. do your work as diligently as possible. Um, stay up to your game in your undergrad because postgrad is basically undergrad mm. with more complexity added. It's just. Yeah integrated now it's just well. integrated because even yeah in undergrad you're doing the separate courses yeah. like it's separate guy you're doing guy only text you're doing text only when you get to postgrad all now of them you are have combined to combine all the four <laughs> but if you still have the care from those individuals well, how do you combine you them? can't combine something <laughs> if you have the gaps so and make sure that you learn the individual principles when you get there it's easy for you to combine okay thank you guys for joining us this is blessing malambo i'm sitting with alungelo mm -hmm. sibanda and yeah, we had a great conversation about high school, the transition to uni and university experiences and also some just light conversations and stuff like that. I hope you guys learned something from this and hope you guys subscribe. I won't forget No, don't that. hope. Hope is not a strategy. Yeah, yeah. Do Sub subscribe. Do subscribe and also follow on TikTok and make sure that you drop that comment and tell us what would you want to hear next if you want to hear like personal strategies tips and whatever it's drop a comment let us know what we want to hear next and we'll definitely provide but for now see you next time Always. any any final words just give us advice if you were to give advice to anyone who's in high school you know whatever it is what advice would you give and then we close the session put your head down do your work diligently and you will reap the, the rewards. I think success yeah. thing is a very linear thing. So do your work and you'll see the rewards. That's the word of the day, word of the night. Word of if the night. If you're listening at For night. Sure. Cheers. Peace. Yo, I'm tired. Yo, I'm tired.